get ready for a fantastic webinar. Really excited to bring this forward. Want to kick off this particular webinar. This is going to be both strategic and tactical at the exact same time. I know that sounds silly, but it is because we have Mary Shea here. So Mary has spent 15 years in the field. She's been one of us. She's been boots on the ground and has seen it from a frontline management perspective and a quota carrying sales professional. And now she's bringing that wisdom to foresters in a research capacity. And uh, Mary, really excited to bring you on board here. Do you uh, want to give a little words of wisdom, a little bit about your background before we kick off? Yes, thanks so much, Jamie, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm really thrilled to be part of the discussion today, and you'll see uh, it's an incredibly exciting and passionate uh, topic for me. But yes, I'll give you a little bit of background. So I uh, have spent uh, much of my career as a quota carrying sales rep. I started out as an inside salesperson and did essentially every job you could do um, within that realm, and then uh, functioned as a chief sales officer, chief marketing officer for about the last 15 years of my professional career. And then recently rejoined Forrester um, about six months ago to be part of the B2B group. So we focus on um, sales enablement and a variety of other topics that are in the go-to-market realm. So I'm an analyst here, and I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. So as Jamie mentioned, I sort of bring both the strategic and the operational to the discussion, and I really look forward to what we're going to talk about today and, and getting some feedback from uh, the attendees as well. Okay, perfect. And so there's going to be five pieces to this agenda. We're going to cover the age of the customer. Then we're going to talk about the Salesforce digital reboot, the basically the why we need to be doing this. Then focus on navigators and consultants. And then as we dive into the consultants, these are the salespeople of the future. And then we want this to be live and dynamic. I want questions. You have Mary here on the call, really be able to help you out understanding where your business needs to be in the upcoming years. So let me cover the age of the customer, and then I want to get to the next slide because Mary's going to dive deep into it. The age of the customer is a 20-year business cycle in which the most successful enterprises will reinvent themselves to systematically understand and serve increasingly powerful customers. Mary, can you help us think through what is happening to businesses, B2B sales forces right now? Absolutely. Thanks, Jamie. So we're about five years into this age of the customer, and it's a topic that Forrester is writing about quite a bit. And if you look at this graphic here, you can see that um, we're really looking at uh, the 20th century. So in the early 20th century, you could see that the um, institutions that really held the power, uh, institutions that figured out how to mass manufacture uh, were key. In the mid-century, looking at the advent of global transportation, you could see companies like P&G and Walmart, uh, they cracked the distribution code. And then at the end of the 20th century, really looking at um, the connected PC and companies that, could, could, that could, could, could control the flow of information, those were the ones that were dominant. So, you know, as we, as we look at the age of the customer, we're talking about both in a B2C and B2B environment, customers that are extremely empowered. Fantastic. You know, when I first saw this infographic, so I started my consulting firm January 1st, 2010, and it took 18 months and a failed business to understand that the customer holds all the cards. And at that time, I was teaching inside sales and cold calling best practices, and it became very clear to me at that time, and around mid-2011, that there was this opportunity, especially social and having digital communication with people that I needed to get there earlier, and I needed to get their attention on an omnipresent standpoint, and the customer was going to learn whether I liked it or not. I needed to be able to facilitate that. It's, and when I saw this, I kind of giggled because 2010 is when I started this whole thing, and it took me a while to figure it out that the customer is going to learn whether I like it or not, and I need to power that. Uh, fantastic, Mary. So let's actually jump into the next piece. B2B buyers are more empowered. I clearly saw this. It almost crippled me as a business owner. Can you explain what this means to the average sales organization or average organization right now? Yeah, absolutely. And so what you see is that with online and mobile channels, 
customers are completely empowered today. So they have access to all kinds of information, whether that's product spec, pricing information, competitive information. Um, they've got the ability to understand um, really detailed dynamics. And so with that, they are really controlling when, where, and how they transact. And so as they become more empowered in this B2B marketplace, the pressure is on for salespeople to raise their game. And I'm sure many folks on the call are really seeing that. Salespeople who communicate only in terms of product and service capabilities are going to see their messages not resonate with buyers. And some of the research that we've done over the past uh, several months shows that senior executives are still pretty unhappy with the type of interactions and engagements they're having with salespeople in the B2B environment. They're saying they don't understand their roles, have empathy for the types of decisions they need to make, they're leading with product, and they don't have a good sense of how their businesses are organized and run and what the financial dynamics are. So again, I think what this means for our audience, whether they're sales leaders or carrying a bag, is that the time that you get with customers and prospects is going to shrink. So when you actually get that time, whether it's remote or in person, you need to maximize that opportunity and really raise the bar to have quality engagements. Mary, this is fantastic, and I know you love statistics, so here's a little deep analysis into our own business as an example. So we, we pulled the content consumption story of our existing customer base. What that means is, what were the digital fingerprints, what were the pieces of insights and content that they consumed along their buying journey? 43% of all of the content that they consume happens before our sales first sales interaction, before our salesperson has even picked up the phone or sent out first email one time. And 75% of that content consumption happens before we even give a demo. Now that's our business, and, I'm, and I mean this is going to resonate with a lot of the research that you've presented, but to your point, the window at which our sales teams are actually communicating live or virtually, you know, through what we're doing now, go to webinar, is quite minimal compared to the entire buying journey that they're going through. Mary, love, love that point. Let's actually kick it into the next gear here, and can you give us an, a sense as to the type of control, uh, and almost like flipping it to Daniel Pink's caveat vended to her, let the seller beware. Help us understand this, this model that you've built here. Great. So, so Jamie, so this timeline really just shows how buyers have acquired information over time, um, how they do it today, and really um, how we see them doing it in the future with this age of the customer concept. So if you think about pre-web, it was really all the information was controlled by the salesperson, right? Um, the best example that I can think about this is really in a B2C environment, whether uh, there's some folks on the, on the call today that maybe bought a car 15 years ago or 10 years ago. You had to go to three or four different dealerships and triangulate price and so on. And so that process has completely gone away, and we even have companies now that are providing test drives at high-volume places like movie theaters and malls so that you can completely disintermediate the salesperson. Um, but so as you look here, you know, you've got sort of got the pre-web where the salespeople control the information. Web uh, 1.0 where you've got sort of this concept of brochure web that, or brochureware that's on the web where, you know, you can start to understand what are the features and functions and benefits and alternatives and so on and so forth. And so looking at the age of the customer, B2B buyers now are accessing information through social sites, they're getting referrals and references online. They're doing detailed comparisons and analysis. They have price transparency in many cases. And so, again, this kind of just links back to what we're talking about is that they're very informed in the process. And when the B2B sales rep engages with these buyers, it has to be a much more informed and higher quality experience. And I'm not saying they necessarily need to wait till the end of the cycle. We want to also see uh, sellers really engage themselves and infuse themselves holistically into the front end of the cycle as these buyers engage with digital and human assets. The key is to you know, tell this buyer something they don't know, share new information, provide significant insights, and be more consultative um, in the engagement. We'll talk more about that as we move forward. When you were a quota carrying sales professional, how often, because this is emerging a lot more, we're noticing, how often were you 
bridging the gap, uh, basically introducing an existing customer to a uh, to a prospective customer, and facilitating almost like a, a round table, whether it's through email or getting them together for lunch, uh, because this seems to be more and more of a trend now that the digital world is able to to help facilitate that conversation. Right, right. So that's a great point. Um, you know, when I started my early career, I was at Forrester, so we certainly did that as part of more formal programs and, and formal structures that we had, but certainly not to the degree that we're seeing it today. And I think, you know, as I think about this concept of getting customers together and customer advocacy, there are a number of really great uh, enablement platforms that are out there that really put some structure and process around this concept of referral-based selling, whether you're getting referrals from uh, employees, from partners, from suppliers, from customers and prospects. And I think that just sort of dials into this whole concept of meeting the buyer um, through the channel in the way that they want to engage. Fantastic. Jumping to the next component here. Sorry, I was just grabbing a question, fueling uh, questions for the future from people putting it in the chat box. And by the way, everybody, please put questions in the chat box. I'm kind of keeping notes of these questions, and I'm pinging Mary with them as we go along. B2B buyers expect to buy more online. Now, I watch my wife basically buy all Christmas gifts this year online, but I think that uh, I think from a B2B context, it will amaze teams how much due diligence, how much information is being consumed before you, the sales professional, get involved. Where can you add some context and value here, Mary, uh, to what's happening at the B2B level? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've really tapped onto a trend that we're seeing um, very, very clearly, which is the B2B buyer. Um, also engages in their personal life and whether they go to Amazon or Zappos or BMW or Nike or whatever their site of choice is, they have some pretty exciting and personalized experiences and they are bringing those expectations now into the business world and expecting and wanting to engage in that same way. And so, you know, what we're showing here is just some data that we um, conducted in 2014 from an online survey and we found that um, you know, 13% or 30% of the B2B buyers surveyed uh, made half or more of their purchases online. And then in the next two years, they're saying they expect to, uh, we expect that to be about 56% making half or more of their purchases online. So the key thing here is that um, this trend is growing and it's growing quickly. This is the statistic. I happen to leverage this statistic when explaining the importance of why your sales team needs to be social selling. Mary, I want you to cue up this statistic and then I want to talk through this. I think this is one of the most important pieces to why social and digital selling has taken, uh, has become a, a powerful tool in B2B organizations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's absolutely critical um, to be going to market with those tools. And so, you know, as buyers conduct more and more research online, as I said, it means that salespeople are going to have less and less access to their customers and prospects. And I hear this when I go out on the road, um, even with our Forrester sales reps. So as the quantity of time diminishes, you're going to need to raise the quality of that engagement and use other tools and platforms so that you're really, really smart uh, before that engagement happens. You understand your customer and prospects affiliations, what their role is, what they're writing about, what kinds of social sites they're on, um, and so on. You know, as I mentioned a, a couple slides ago, think about this, three quarters of all of that consumption, every, basically all the insights they need to make in, informed decisions is being done before we've even given, given a demo. And, in, and when you start analyzing what they're consuming and why, they they have basically built a mental model of what they need, how social selling would be implemented, the whole roadmap. Basically, they only need us to talk through the implementation game plan, some pricing, perhaps talk to a customer or two. But it's so incredible that you know when I, when Mary put this slide here. It is, we are talking only 1% difference between what we're seeing on a content consumption and the actual statistic right here. So when B2B buyers want to engage 
you know, you've, you've done some studies here of 224 U.S. buyers here. What's the data say? Yeah, so, I mean, we've heard a lot about the fact that um, B2B buyers want digital self-service. They are um, comfortable with the early stages in the sales process, engaging online, and so on and so forth. But, you know, it isn't all doom and gloom for salespeople. There are times when uh, the buyers do want to engage in person. And you can imagine that this is not surprising, you know, when the product or service is expensive or complex, when it requires potentially an on-premise installation. We're not seeing as much of that these days, but maybe there's a big training or service component that's part of the rollout. And then finally, you know, when they're uh, negotiating price. I mean, buyers want to have that in-person connection or over-the-phone connection when negotiating and consummating a deal. And they also, I think, and I'd be interested to hear what some of the salespeople on the phone um, have experienced, I think after a long, arduous sales cycle, you and that buyer usually become friends of some sort. And the buyer wants continued confirmation and affirmation from that salesperson that, hey, I made the right choice. I put my neck out. I've, I put myself on the line professionally and want to know that you as a vendor are going to be behind me. And I think that human component never really goes away. So I think it's really just about how do you, as a salesperson, use all of your assets, whether those are, are your human assets, digital assets, and engage in a holistic way, the way that buyers want to engage. You know, actually, so there was an individual asking a few questions, and, and let's actually dive into this because, I mean, remember, there's always people that agree and then disagree with, with some of the research and data that we're seeing. The, uh, and he had brought up two scenarios, and uh, coming back to that car analogy, he had mentioned, well, you know, I don't, I don't see people actually buying vehicles without a test drive, and then he related it to software as a service. Uh, I'm going to give my two cents, and then Mary, you can elaborate on it. I, I live in the city of Toronto here, and in the city of Toronto, there have already been 15 car dealerships that have gone completely self-service, zero sales professionals. And in fact, if you go online right now, I can't believe, I think it was last week, I think it's either Lexus or Infinity, has now offered a 360-degree uh, virtual reality tour. And I'm, when I mean virtual reality tour, I mean if you look down at the, you know, the cigarette lighter, you get a view of the cigarette lighter. They're trying to recreate the environment to yeah. mitigate the, 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 you know, the expensive piece, which is the, the on-show sales por portion. When it comes to software as a service, you know, I look at our 250 customers, which are mostly technology companies. Um, there is no question that between the due diligence that the CIO or the CMO can do on G2 Crowd, is, uh, is reaching out to the CIO forum on the LinkedIn network. They're asking referrals. I mean, our own company has uh, bought a marketing automation platform, HubSpot, solely because of experience from before and or referral. We didn't even, I don't even recall us ever doing a test drive of it. It was based on a referral. So I, I'm a huge believer that in the B2B space, like we'll buy technology and I know our customers are selling technology based on, on you know the perceived value they don't need to go through the old the old school demos like they did before I, I, am I correct in this saying this Mary or well you know certainly I have a, a point of view and I think it, it does um, there are some new nuances across industries and size of organization and considerations around whether it's a product or services type of company but um, to the person who mentioned I don't ever see anyone buying a car without a test drive. Um, I agree, and I actually started out my sales career as a um, Honda and BMW salesperson while I was finishing my oh, doctorate. So it's a it's a space that I know a little bit about, and I got this company called GoMoto, G-O-M-O-T-O dot -O com. My friend's the CEO. His name is Todd Marcelli, and he's created a completely disruptive business model where you can actually go to malls, movie theaters, other high traffic areas and test drive three to four comparable makes and models uh, without having a salesperson uh, pressure you, without Love being it. in a dealership. And then they've created some really exciting kiosk where you can actually go in and um, configure your car and do your purchase or actually purchase online. So I think that businesses that really figure out how to crack the code will disintermediate um, large, large businesses that are too slow to adopt to the change. Fantastic. Okay, so let's get into the second piece here. 
we're going through a Salesforce digital reboot. Now, there is, uh, you know, this was an infographic that did really well, a little bit controversial. Yes. It is stated that there's one million U.S. sales jobs. So if there's a million in the U.S., that means there's 100,000 in my country, Canada, sales to get one-tenth, sales jobs are limited by 2020. Can you go through this very controversial study? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, I have to credit uh, Daniel for doing a tremendous job on creating the infographics here. Um, but yes, um, this is a purposefully provocative statement. And I don't know if some of the members of this on the call have ever had a chance to read Andy Hoare's report, The Death of the B2B Salesman. And I think uh, you all did some infographics around that as well earlier in the year. And so in that report, Andy predicted that the U.S. sales force would contract um, by about a million jobs in the next five years. And, you know, initially that created a lot of angst among salespeople and a lot of controversy and a lot of anger. Um, but I think what was really important about the data and the research that Andy did is that it really surfaced a very important conversation that needed to be had, which is B2B buyers are fundamentally shifting the ways they want to engage with, and selling organizations need to adapt. And if they don't adapt, they're going to be left behind. Now, again, I think this is an incredibly exciting time to be a sales rep uh, because you're going to engage in ways you've never dreamed of engaging before, and you're going to add tremendous value. But, you know, if you're not up for the change, I think there's going to be some challenges. I completely agree. And, in fact, you have an outline of basically there, there are four types, sales professional types, archetypes. There you go. It's looking for the word. It's right at the top. Walk me through whether you're a sales leader, commercial leader, or you're a rep, himself, a rep yourself, this is where you can look in a mirror a little bit. Talk us through these four archetypes. Absolutely. And so, you know, the way we start to think about these archetypes, and there are archetypes that are, are selling ar archetypes and buying archetypes, and organizations can have their different ways of characterizing them, but this is what Forrester has, uh, has done. And we really look at what's the complexity of the buyer dynamic as well as how complex the product and service is to take to market. And we've created these four archetypes on the seller side. Um, you've got your order takers and your explainers. And so order takers are pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go into that. But explainers are folks who really lead with product, all right? So product and service, feature, function. And in the work that we do with clients, you know, we see that most of these client organizations that we're working with have a large degree of order takers and explainers that are part of their sales organization. On the right-hand side of this um, graphic here, you get to sort of the more strategic discussion, which is you've got navigators and consultants. And so navigators are the types of salespeople that um, bring value to the discussion by having multiple stakeholder relationships. They understand how to tin cup and get budget. They can create financial ROIs. They're the type of salesperson, if you've actually taken a meeting from one of these guys, is that they can tell you more about what's going on in your organization than you might know. And some people actually take meetings to make sure they're plugged into what's going on. And then on the consultant side, those are the true consultant salespeople, the salespeople that can add value, can bring thought leadership to the table, can tell their prospect or customer something new, something they didn't know before. Fantastic. I used to, I used to just call the consultant piece the teacher-student relationship, uh, in the in that sense that, uh, or like the coach kind of thing. But I mean, that might have been the wrong word to use, but that's how I used to describe it. So, how is that mix going to change? Because I, I laugh when I saw the explainers. I remember in my early sales days, um, the CEO walked by my desk as he was doing a uh, a tour of the office, and he turned to me and he said. This is our number one demo doer. And I, I cringe every time I heard it, I thought, wow, I'm so valuable. You just think I'm basically a tape recorder who's better yeah. at tape and playing than other people. So explain to us who's going to survive this grudge match. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of a left-handed comment, I might say a compliment. But oh, yeah. Yeah. it's not surprising um, that you see that there's going to be significant decline in order takers and explainers with um, order takers declining by about 37 percent and, expl and explainers by about 27 percent in the next five years. Um, and uh, navigators, as you can imagine, 
the skill set that they bring to the table, the characteristics that they bring to the pursuit, um, are a little bit more difficult to replace with technology, so there'll be less decline there. And then on the consultant side, actually those salespeople are going to increase by 10%. And so if you think about where sales organizations are today with um, their archetypes or their selling profiles, there are very few consultants that are in seat. So organizations, and for the sales leaders on this call, are going to have to start to think about much more creative sourcing strategies to bring in this type of talent, whether that's internal from a client success team or from a consulting team or externally going to uh, some of your top tier business schools to uh, pluck these folks into uh, your organization. Yeah, and I, and I know that we're going to dive into that, whether it's a recruitment or, a, or if this is a behavioral shifting exercise. But technology will mostly displace order takers and explainers, and we know this. Maybe we'll just we'll quickly move to that, that next section and focus in on the navigators and the consultants around the who's going to be the sole survivor, as I know you were just elaborating on that. Any kind of last points you want to bring on to this? Because I know what the, everybody's looking forward to is, okay, do I need to recruit for this? Can I yeah. change? Because that was one of the challenges. I, I just used the word challenger. I mean, you, people used to say about the challenger sale, well, that's great and all that people are challengers. How yeah. do I do I displace the ones that aren't out? Do I recruit for it? Do I change them? Anything yeah. around this slide, and then we can move into the, the doing. Yeah, it's a great, great question, and, and probably one that's worthy of, of, of more time than what we have today. But I think the first thing you want to do is really understand you know, where your organization sits. And I think, you know, there's plenty of opportunity for order takers and, and sellers, but they probably need to be an inside or an in, or, uh, inside and technology supported channel, right? So I see some restructuring moving there as well as, um, you know, potentially moving some of those folks out of the business. But organizations really need to focus on developing training and arming up these navigators and consultants that they have in, in internal in-house. And so that is arming them with the right technology tools and platforms and really providing the right type of training and development that's probably a bit more customized and more um, suited to uh, what this consultant skill set is going to need than the typical challenger, value selling, spin selling that we've all heard of in the past. Fantastic. So can you explain to us, okay, so we now recognize that um, enablement, behavioral changing, and especially continuous rep repetition to make that change to a consultant. What are they going to look like? And then let's get into uh, how we create that behavioral change. But what, is it, what does a consultant look like? How can we identify one if I were to walk my sales floor? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you want to do is, is really um, sort of see if you buy into this model. And if so, start to do some assessments within your own organization. But, you know, the consultant salesperson is going to embrace technology and by that I mean not just recognize that technology is important to do their job, but be savvy, a savvy user um, in a variety of different types of systems, whether it's sales enablement, automation um, systems, whether it's social systems, whether it's a variety of different technologies that they're using ongoing. Um, we talked about the sharing new ideas, so speaking at events, providing thought leadership, telling a buyer something new. Exhibit business acumen. A lot of you know chief sales officers and chief marketing officers believe already that their sales force exhibits business acumen, but when I dig in deeper, do they really understand how to read a financial balance sheet? Do they understand how companies operate? Do they really understand the role that they're talking to and how that person gets judged? Um, communication is going to be really key as well. I'm talking to clients that say, for first meetings, we're seeing 25 people show up. How does my salesperson have the skill set to be able to navigate and negotiate that type of um, conversation or sales meeting? We're seeing many, many more people involved in the sales cycle. And then seeking collaboration. With this, I really mean finally ending up, ending that tension that you know we always talk about between sales and marketing. I see marketing and sales roles blending, where sales is taking on aspects of marketing and becoming micro-marketers. So instead of the one-to-many, they're using marketing techniques on a one-to-one, -one, but using those same techniques and technologies to be really, really smart about how they go about their business. And then leveraging data and analytics. I think we need salespeople that understand, um, you know, sort of qualitative and quantitative um, analytics, and not just understand their territories and their account base, but to be able to deliver insights back to their clients. 
you know, I, I definitely want to come back to the micro marketer or the smarter at one point, but something tactical for everybody in the audience. I'm a huge believer in leading indicators, current indicators, and lagging indicators to determine, especially behavioral change. If you look at embrace technology and leveraging data, this is an opportunity. If I'm a commercial leader or a frontline sales manager, I can use usage of that technology. And also, if you have an employee advocacy program or uh, whether you're using whatever platform you're using, you can determine, are my sales professionals taking the ideas that we're providing? So please use this technology, and it says leveraging data, so it means selling with insights. Are they actually taking you know, learned behavior and translating it to sales outcomes? Are they, are, are they actually making that behavioral shift? So you can use this as your early indicator, your leading indicator to determine who are the people that are most apt to trying to make that change? And that can be a tactical measurement that you could leverage to identify some of these people. I just wanted to throw out yeah. an idea. If I, let me just amplify on that, Jamie, because I think it's a great point. I have a lot of clients asking me, okay, so we buy into this consultant salesperson of the future. What are the new metrics um, for us to measure success, right? Um, and they're not just the standard metrics that we've used in the past, the standard KPIs, and I think you've put forth some really good ones, which is how are they embracing technology? Um, what's their activity like on um, different types of social sites and so on? So you made some good points there. Yeah, it's, it, kind of like in an interv interview process, uh, I know that my business partner loves to ask, what are you reading right now? Show me your Audible's account. Show, like, show me, show me the list of eBooks you've just read in the last week, kind of thing. And it's a, again, an indicator to their, uh, to their interest and intrigue of learning something new. It, again, it's just that leading indicator. So, we've we started covering a little bit more of the consultants of the future. I want to jump into, uh, as we're finishing up the reboot, because we have an, an, another section. Uh, I want you to explore a little bit around uh, salespersons of the future, but also can you talk to us a little bit about something you and I were talking offline around more research you want to do around millennials? Yeah, fantastic. So um, I've got a piece that I'm working on uh, that I'm going to publish before the end of this year, which really is looking at, you know, how do we engage, enable, and retain millennial salespeople? So, you know, I think this is the first year where we've actually had more millennials in the workplace than baby boomers. And Great. so they want to learn, engage um, in very, very different ways. And so I'm really looking to start to delve into what do organizations need to do to provide this type of sales uh, force with the right support, whether that's, you know, tools, technologies, development. And then the flip side of that is really, how do we take all of the years of knowledge that some of these tenured reps have, um, the art of the deal, so to speak, the intangibles, and, and cross-pollinate that with some of the things that these new uh, reps need to learn? So I'll be doing some research on that, as well as the growing importance of inside sales um, as a function. Many of you know that over the last uh, three years, inside sales relative to field sales has grown 15 to 1. So those are a couple of topics I'm, I'm going to be writing about in the next uh, month or two. And if anyone has a point of view or anything to add, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and this, is, uh, th this comes back to the importance of, of the emergence of the micro-marketer, or also known as the smarketer. I'm a huge believer, if you, as an organization that starts creating sales and marketing alignment, but even better is sales and marketing integration, we like to call it the IP, as an in intellectual property transfer loop. And this is where inside sales, as an example, becomes such an important component. Imagine the marketing team actually sitting with the inside sales team and say, what are the objections that you keep getting? What are customers saying to you? And so the salespeople who are frontline hearing pitfalls, challenges, best practices, and objections, they give that to the content marketing team. Content marketing team then develops an asset like we're sitting in front of right now in infographic. That then gets fueled back to the inside sales team. They share it commercially into the, uh, into the marketplace. The marketplace then gives them feedback, good, bad, or ugly, based on the information. And then they, again, on a, whether it's a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis, are sitting back down with content marketing 
and deciding are there edits we need to make to that content, derivatives of it, or are there new insights that we didn't ever encounter before. This IP transfer loop is what really starts to fuel the salesperson thinking like marketing and marketing, of course, thinking more like sales uh, to start developing content that actually fuels quota attainment. Now, all of a sudden, you've got the art, as, as you were just saying, Mary, the art and the science kind of working together. Uh, I'm a huge believer that the future sales professional will use marketing assets in, in, as like an arrow in their quiver no different than the marketer is already doing it through their normal social and email channels. So uh, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. And I love that you're going to do more research on this, uh, with, you know, with, uh, you know, whether it's with Bob Perkins at AAISP and so forth. I want to double check and make sure that we cover some questions that people might have as we're, you know, we're, what are we doing for time here? Uh, we've been going for 35 minutes. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, there's a question here. Outside of gathering new contacts and names, this is a very tactical question, but outside of gathering new contacts and names, how would you measure LinkedIn activity when you're looking at some of these changes to the workforce? Think, you know, put your, 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 your field hat back on, Mary. Uh, anything you want to add there, and then I can add to this particular question. Yeah, I mean, I, that is pretty tactical, so I probably defer to you, Jamie, but, you know, I think it's, it's really, um, you know, you want to move beyond this concept of measuring numbers and activities to more um, measurable opportunities in the pipeline and deals transacted. So I um, am less interested in sort of how many contacts you've added in or what you've done uh, with LinkedIn and more you know, what types of creative ways have you used to insert mature opportunities into the pipeline as a result of some of these social uh, platforms that you might be using? So, and this is where I think a lot of people uh, are, when they start thinking about measurement, this is where, I, like I'm a huge believer that your CRM and your marketing automation platform become, you know, the end-all, be-all of, of what truly is, um, the end result of where you need to be gathering. Again, it's your lagging indicator where you're gathering all your data. I totally agree with that. The one thing I can give Jeff as a tactical piece, and then I see some other questions coming in, is um, I, I want to identify what are the what are the actions or activity that can actually correlate to uh, showing that I am making uh, an improvement on my named accounts or so forth. Another one idea that you could uh, you could potentially measure, this is just an idea, especially if you're using a Navigator account, is what's happening right now is you've been assigned, if, I'm assuming Jeff, if, if you're a quota carrying sales professional, you've been assigned a specific group of accounts with you know contacts within them. I, as a frontline sales manager, would want to say, if I have assigned you 50 named accounts, I want to see that your CRM data and your social network are a one-to-one -one ratio. I want to determine that, in fact, if I gave you these 50 accounts, I want to see that you have that you are tagged and are following those particular companies and all the decision makers, champions, and influencers, both socially, meaning socially surrounding them, and in your CRM, because they're, you know, that, that's how we're going to conduct business. Uh, anyways, I, I know that that was a little bit more tactical than we wanted to get, Mary. I'm going to try to find uh, other questions here. How do we defeat old and odd sourcing practices. I'm trying to put context to that, but anything, Mary, does that mean yeah, much to you? I'm not sure if they mean sourcing, you know, talent sourcing or sourcing lead sourcing. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's the second. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's just about trying to, you know, read research like Forrester's research try to talk to companies that are out there doing really innovative things. Many of your types of clients, the SaaS providers are leading the charge and really getting conversant with some of the great technologies that are out there that can enable you to go about your prospecting and uh, sourcing in a much more intelligent way. So there are technologies that you know you can open up your email and the list of, of, of companies that fall in your email are the ones that you should call in order based on the likelihood that they might close this quarter. Um, there are other companies that are out there that can help 
uh, pull in a variety of different data sources, machine learning, and direct you to the contacts that are most likely to be receptive to your campaigns. So making it your business to get out there and understand what are the most innovative companies doing and who are the most innovative uh, technology providers. So here's a great one for you, Mary. What are the best ways to approach management about finally introducing an effective sales and marketing alignment strategy? <laughs> I, oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's a tough one. I mean, I you know it continues to to bubble up again and again, and um, you know I I think it's it's again about trying to get some use cases. And I'm working with a Forrester client right now who just did a survey across a thousand sales and marketing professionals, um, both leaders as well as field folks, and um, it's really interesting to see that. Many of the old stereotypes are starting to uh, to change, and there's start, starting to be more mutual respect and alignment between the groups. So, you know, I think it's really about sharing uh, presentations like this and thought leadership, um, outside sources that can help support the conversation. Get yourself up as high in the organization as you can, um, and and ultimately, I think you know it is really about aligning. Uh, sales and marketing from a compensation and accountability standpoint. And we're still not there yet, but I think we'll be heading in that direction in the not too distant future. Well, and Dominic, uh, give you a real life example right here. Here's what I want you to, to ask senior leadership. Does, this, does the buying journey that a buyer goes through, is it any different for the marketing team than the sales team? The answer is no. We are all one team. We're on team revenue. We, the buyer goes through one funnel. It just happens that some people spend more of their time concentrating on the top part of the funnel rather than the middle and the bottom of the funnel. This is a real life example and I thought I closed my emails but apparently I didn't. But this is, uh, what you see right now, this is a VP at Staples right now engaging in our content. The important piece is that that engagement doesn't end at the top of the funnel when your inside sales team picks up the phone and books a meeting. No, this engagement, this content consumption story happens all the way till they become a customer and beyond. And understanding that marketing has a direct lead sourcing, so uh, they, they actually create leads, and they have what's called lead influence, which is also known as lead attribution. Everything that they do and you do together influence these buyers throughout that buying journey. So I think that if you can articulate it in, in a way to explain to them, listen, we are one team. Like, there's empirical evidence that the buyer travels through one pipeline. It just happens that we all work it together. Hopefully that unlocks the brain cells to go, wow, maybe we really should be collaborating more together. Uh, next, next question. Um, how do we promote, uh, I just want, I just want to make sure, how do we promote this form, these formal ideas around technology challenges to sales directors who are not accustomed to, uh, especially are not end users of some of these technologies? Right, right. Yeah, that 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 is challenging, and you know, you certainly can get some defensiveness and pushback um, from sales managers who may be comfortable in their own way of going to market. And I think the best way is to really start with asking questions both of the field team as well as the sales management team, how has your approach to going to market changed over the last two to three years? How easy is it to get access to customers? What are some of the frustrations that you're feeling? And to, to allow them to surface the challenges that they're, they're facing, because I'd be very shocked if they aren't having you know, less and less access to customers and more and more frustration. And you know, once they sort of surface those, I think you can start to um, introduce in bite-sized chunks some of these ideas and solutions that will help them and their sales team engage uh, more effectively in this new marketplace. Well, this has been fantastic. Mary, I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, please, uh, Mary, we're going to be sending in the email follow-up. Uh, Mary is going to be looking for millennial rock stars, to be doing a study on, uh, maybe you can elaborate, Mary, there's a wrap up on, I don't want to sell your idea, you have a, you can articulate no. it better than I can. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking to identify uh, one or two millennial sales rep 
rock stars. Um, so the, the reps who have embraced this model, um, and I'm looking to do an interview with a couple of them as part of the research that I'm going to publish on, you know, what, what does the millennial sales force need? Naturally, you know, we interview a lot of our clients and executives, but I really want to get in there um, a couple of rock stars who are doing it right and who are in the field today. Fantastic. So um, please reach out to Mary, or you can, if you happen to be connected to myself, um, reach out to myself. I can introduce you to Mary. Uh, unfortunately, I'm too old, so I can't participate. <laughs> but uh, 